So thanks for joining our monthly security synopsis webinar. Great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Roshni Tawama, who's been a, a friend and colleague of mine for, for several years. We've uh, we've been really lucky because Roche is either presenting to the security committee at the House of Lords or flying off to NATO uh, to brief them on cybersecurity or going to pick up awards for being one of the um, Barclays Tech 100 women. And I think, Roche, you're also EU Cyber Woman of the Year. Have I got that right? I am. Yeah, that's forget. right. Um, so many awards and, and so little time. So look, um, Roche joins us from, from Redshift. So I think it would be rude for us not to let Roche just talk for a few seconds about Redshift, her employers, and also one of the latest cyber partners of Node4. So Roche, tell us a wee bit about yourself and, and Redshift just to get us going. Great. I'll tell you a bit about Redshift. So we're an award-winning, fast-growing, top 100 cybersecurity firm to watch. And we solve for the biggest problems. We build for the largest companies in the world, but they're capable of being scaled down so that they can be deployed in mom and pop operations. Because we understand at Redshift that in order for our big clients to be protected, then their supply chain must be protected because this is a, a team effort. Um, and it's and we're only successful through partnerships like Node 4, and I'm delighted to be here, Andy. Thanks so much. Brilliant, thanks for that. Um, so look, we're here today to talk about DORA, which is the Digital Operational Resiliency Act. Probably the last time we'll, we'll use a four letter acronym. I guess DORA falls into the framework of um, cyber governance. And, and I think a lot of people think they know what cyber governance is. Um, you've got a PhD in law, so we've got access to a, an amazing expert today. So give us your view on, on cyber governance before we dive deeper into DORA, please. OK, great. So, yeah, it's really helpful to understand because everybody understands what corporate governance is. And there's a classic definition that's, that was given in 1997, and I'm not going to go into it, but there's a bit at the end of that classic definition. And Schleifer, Schleifer and Vishni, the two guys who came up with this definition, had a really clever line and it was, you know, how do investors make sure that management aren't investing their money in bad projects or, um, or you know, or stealing it actually is, is what they said. So it's like if you look at cyber governance and then you consider how do you make sure that your investment in your digital estate, you're not putting your resources, your limited resources into bad projects and that you're putting it into um, tools and solutions that will materially move the needle. And that's what cyber governance is. It's just a small part of corporate governance to make sure that the firm isn't wasting its resources. Brilliant. So so targeted investment. And I guess a, a personal frustration of mine is people who just love buying flashy boxes and technology. So good governance helps you to put your investment into the right place. So on to DORA then. Um, so my limited understanding of DORA is it's one of the latest things out of the EU. It's probably going to hit the streets next year. I guess the um, almost the inverse question is, if no DORA, what's going to happen? How bad are, are things going to be if this um, act isn't implemented or if we don't pay attention to it? So the act is already in force, but compliance is in January 2025. And if I think the EU hadn't devised it, we'd be in a real pickle. Look, we've seen, you know, the threat landscape expanding. We've seen businesses, banks particularly, do a really good job. But you know, this goes back to, to you know, who we are at Redshift. Unless we're all in this together and everyone is shoring up their defences, then that is going to be the angle of entry. And so there's an inevitability about legislation and regulation following lots of market failures. So I'll give you an instance, actually, Andy, because it's, it's more helpful to illustrate it in this way. The HSE ransomware attack in Ireland um, that took out the, the health service uh, was avoidable and foreseeable. And when I say it was foreseeable, I mean, it was really, truly foreseeable. So a year before they were attacked, Interpol had published a report into the healthcare sector right across Europe. And they'd said to them, look, guys, this is you're going to be one of your biggest problems. These are the criminals who are going to do it. And this is how you guard against it. And they didn't do it. So it was foreseeable and it was avoidable. And the cost for them to mitigate that problem would have been less than a million. 
the cost for them to manage the fallout and to put themselves back into the position they were in the day before the ransomware was deployed um, is in the region of like 60 to 80 million. And we just can't stomach these kinds of failures on that scale anymore. Um, the, what, we're, what we've learned, we've loads of data now, what we've learned is that it's rarely a novel um, attack and it's rarely sophisticated. So we've heard a lot in the past about people talking about, oh, it's a sophisticated nation state actor. And it's like, okay, that's all very well, but is it a sophisticated act? And if it's an act that can be done quite crudely and quite easily that a firm could have defended against, then that's a real problem, not just for the firm, but for all of its stakeholders, the wider community. And it's not, it's not, it's not hyperbole to say that this is now a national, um, it's a national security matter. Brilliant. And I guess to, to re-emphasize that, as you say, a lot of people get obsessed by advanced persistent threats and ransomware and fancy bears and fancy pandas. And yet we all know the defense against those is actually pretty simple. Put in MFA, change your password. The, the basic stuff is the defense to the really sophisticated thing. So I guess where you're going with this or where we could go with this is if Dora says you should act reasonably, it's unreasonable to say the Russian state are attacking me, but it is reasonable to say you should have changed your passwords and should have moved to MFA if you you knew something was going to hit you. So so that's brilliant. Um, I hate to ask the, the B question, but the Brexit question. So when GDPR happened, a load of people falsely said, well, Brexit's going to happen. GDPR doesn't apply to us. So guess what? Here's a new regulation coming out of Europe called Dora. We're sat here in the uh, island of, of the UK uh, post Brexit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, same same story again five years later. Are people wrong to say that I'm British? Dora doesn't matter to me. Uh, <laughs> this is like this is a Schrodinger's. <laughs> this is Schrodinger. They're right yeah. and they're wrong uh, simultaneously. So look, it, it it won't apply if you don't have an office in Europe. It won't apply if you don't um, have clients in Europe. And it won't apply if you don't fall within the scope. Maybe you're an ICT third party supplier. If you want to sell to banks in Europe, then it's going to apply to you. Um, and then I would say, look, this, this is a really sensible piece of regulation, even if it doesn't apply to you. Um, you know, the healthcare sector, the energy sector, all of the critical national infrastructures, they would do well to look at this because, in my view, this is a sign of things to come. So, back, but back to your question, it's yeah, it's yes and no. Will it apply? It will definitely apply if um, if you've got if you want to reach in and get European clients, Dublin, Paris, wherever, um, and it'll definitely apply if if you're an ICT third party supplier supplying to any of the uh, European entities to any of those, which would include organizations like ourselves. And again, I think this came out with GDPR that said, you know, if you've got one European employee, it's going to apply. But actually, how do you know? And and as you said, it's a sensible thing to comply to. So why not do a sensible thing? And then you've avoided the risk of of actually turning away that one client. It could be a, a really amazing client. Mm. So brilliant. Um, Any surprises in the act? So for me, I so there's two there's two really big surprises. One was the criminal penalties. So but back, this is back again to GDPR. Remember when GDPR came out, there was a thing that everyone was talking about it and they were talking about the fine and they were fixated on the fine. They would say 4% of global annual turnover or 20 million euros, whichever is is highest. And nobody talked about people going to prison. And yet, about three months ago, we had a CEO in Finland um, receive a prison sentence for serious failings and the, of, of GDPR. So it was a data breach. So the facts are interesting. It was a data breach and it was a clinic. And the data that was breached was incredibly sensitive. It was uh, there were um, it was therapists and there were recordings. And they, um, there was a ransomware was deployed, and when they didn't pay the ransom, this information was released into the wild. Um, but nobody back in 2018 was talking about potential prison sentences. Now, it was suspended, but in some ways that's immaterial because that CEO is never going to be able to recover his career with a prison sentence like that 
for failings of that kind. And also any regulatory fine is going to take into account. But what DORA does is it actually says there will be criminal penalties. And that's shifting it away from civil to criminal. And then there's a whole can of worms and there's a whole lot of pain that businesses don't want to have to deal with and individuals won't want to have to deal with. Actually, it, this, there's another, there was another case here in, in the UK where uh, the former CIO of TSB Bank uh, received a personal penalty for failing to take reasonable care. And so we're seeing that creep away from the firm and people being able to use the firm as a shield to personal responsibility. And I think it's that is what's going to have to change uh, if we're going to if we're going to make the progress that we need to make as swiftly as we need to make it. Ah, oh, there's another one. Sorry, Andy. Yeah. So criminal criminal sanctions, um, <coughs> criminal penalties was one. There was another surprise in it, which I thought was a very clever move, and that was managing the exit strategies. So we all have anecdotes about um, contracts that were put in place. And, you know, at the time, I, I, I suppose if, if we give everyone the benefit of the doubt and we say, OK, well, you know, at the time that they were putting these things in, they weren't looking at into 10 years into the future. And maybe they were good then, but they're not great now. And you could have them removed, but the, but the business disruption would mean that banks who are not allowed to have business disruption, else they'll be fined under other rules and regulations, um, need to continue to keep this kit in place so that they don't suffer the business disruption and they're paying out on a contract that they're getting no value from. Now, typically the courts won't make good a bad bargain, right? It's like, oh, well, it's too bad. You made the bargain. You can either face the fine and suffer the business disruption and deal with it that way, or you're going to need to continue to pay. What this managing the exit strategies provision does is it allows all of the financial entities across Europe to go back and reopen all of those contracts and say to those providers, we need to do this because this is the law. The law has changed since we signed off on this contract. So now we have to understand how you're going to leave with minimum disruption. And what that's done is it's given the banks and all of the financial entities a, a type of consumer power that they haven't had before, which is really unusual because when you think about banks, you think of them with deep pockets and wielding all the power in these relationships. But actually, when you've got kit that's in place, that's not fit for purpose, that if they were to take it out, you know, you have the, the vendor saying, oh, well, you know, I could take it out, but oh, it's going to be weeks and the disruption. And then people are like, and then business is way up. OK, what's it going to cost to us in terms of fines and in terms of customer dissatisfaction and reputational damage and all that kind of stuff? And they go, you know what, just give them the million, just give them the million until next year or eight million or whatever it is. But we all have stories that, that we know that this has been going on for a while. So, so ironically, and, and I, I saw in your article recently where you're a guest columnist in PC Pro, uh, so please rush out and buy that to get the, the full free Dora guide, as it were. I was surprised when you said about managing exit strategy. So I guess for an organisation like ourselves dealing with an incumbent, Dora is now a useful conversation. But equally, if somebody was migrating away from, let's say, legacy kit to cloud, and there's a cabillion reasons why that's hard and difficult, now Dora enacts something that that effectively could be used to accelerate that. So that was a that was a big surprise for me. So I guess so far, I think we've worked out that if I was a CEO of a bank or building society or financial institution in the UK, it's almost inevitable that I would be trading or have clients in Europe. Therefore, Dora definitely applies. But I guess, could we just quickly walk through who else it applies to? I think any suppliers to those kind of organizations, that, that would be the case as well. Yeah, yeah. So actually, it's interesting because it is it's it, it 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 applies to everyone so you name it if it holds manages protects rates raises invests creates or transfers money it's on that list as a financial entity it's really broad it's everything from banks to crypto asset bros 
Um, and, I, and it's interesting that crypto um, asset companies are on it. And it's not because I think crypto is being taken seriously. It's that like, oh, if you want to play in this in, in a regulated space, you're going to need to do an awful lot of work. Yeah. And then then what we should see is we should see the sort of a police, they'll self police, right? I'll be like, look, you know, the, 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 the cost of entry into being a part of the financial sector is prohibitively expensive. And at least we are able to contain things in that way. Um, so yeah, and then it also includes ICT third party suppliers, which is entirely normal. I was reading the other day, that the World Economic Forum did a survey of chief economists in May. And of those surveyed, they 100% of the chief economists said that there was going to be a change in how uh, supply chain is managed. 100%. That's a huge, that's huge, right? You get 100% you get of nothing except maybe a primary school spelling test. Okay. So then, you look at it and then 91% of the chief economists that were surveyed said that there was going to be a reprioritization of resilience over efficiency in the supply chain. Now that's going to, that's going to be, you know, supply chain issues right across the board, but it will include cyber. So when people are reconsidering their supply chain and they're reconsidering the cyber element, there's going to be that reprioritization. Of resilience over um, over efficiency. Okay, wow. So that so that means banks, finance sector, like say people in crypto, if they're actually whether they're re provisioning a new supplier or not, need to be asking them about their cyber credentials. And it sounds like if they can't prove their own resiliency, they probably need two options. Because to me, that's what resiliency always means. You've got two or something with with a bit of independence. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of it 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 that's really fact dependent, isn't it? So it's, it's, you know, how big are you? What are your needs? Because, because you might not apply that right across the board. You might apply that for um, a single product. You may not need to apply it for a single product if, and, and then this goes to one of the provisions that's in door with respect to tools, right? So there's now a requirement for tools to be reliable and trustworthy and essentially fit for purpose today. I'm looking at a couple of tools out there and when I when you um, benchmark them against each other, there's really only one solution in the market that will meet the obligations under Dora. And and I guess in back to your article, you talk about Dora is probably going to accelerate the inevitable move to cloud. But I guess with resiliency, does that mean having two clouds is the way forward or is it that everybody can trust Microsoft Azure because it's just so big and so resilient in it in its own right? What are your thoughts around that? So this is, I appreciate you're not a cloud expert. No, but, no, no, but it's okay because I'm a legal expert, so I, I, I'm fine and I feel comfortable answering that. So it, the, the, it's the great thing about governance and, and EVA and, and, this, and this act is that it's proportionate. Right. So it will be a different answer for different firms, depending on like a myriad of factors, you know, you know, like how big are they? How wealthy are they? How interconnected are they? Do they play like a pivotal role in the financial sector that they're quite small, but everybody is touching them? They're going to have a different set of roles and responsibilities to maybe even a bigger firm that's not as wealthy but only touches one or two. This is really, and this is, and this is where law firms stand to, you know, when it, wherever you have a new piece of legislation, law firms are always able to drive efficiencies in their own business. But this is where law firms are going to um, really come into their own with their understanding of, this is the type of business that you are, and therefore, these are the things that you will need to do. So if I was to give you a sort of a plain vanilla cookie cutter response to it, it would be disingenuous and it would be it just wouldn't be anywhere close to accurate. Brilliant. But I think what I take from that is if you're the Bank of England or New Building Society, this applies, but applies to different degrees, obviously, according to your proportionality as part of the, the UK PLC, I guess. So brilliant. Um, I guess, again, to put you on the spot, I mean, I kind of think there's about five or six major areas as, as the headlines in Dora. Do you just want to take us through 
almost in a way that my mother would understand if you if you sure. don't mind to go, you know what are the if i'm talking to a ceo of a uk finance organization tomorrow mm -hmm. what are the six things that i need to tell her or him that they need to be thinking about around dora because by the way my follow-on question is if i talk to big banks yeah. they've heard of dora they can spell it most people in the uk in the finance sector i go what are you doing about dora and they just stare at me blankly so Maybe let's do the five or six first, and then I want to want to come back to that because that worries me a, a wee bit. Okay, so uh, so it's interesting that you said the five or six because everywhere, if you like, you input Dora, they'll say, "Oh, the five pillars of Dora," and I was like, it, "Surely it's six, right?" But okay, so I'm going to say six, and it's somewhat controversial that I'm saying six, but it's you know you read the document and it there's six pillars in it. So the first of all is the governance requirements, and that is the, like in a tweet for um you know. Uh, people's grannies is management bear the final responsibility. This isn't new, but it absolutely puts uh, management on express notice as to their obligations. There's no maneuvering around it. The second thing is risk management. It's plain vanilla risk management. You have to have a, um, it must be a, based on a recognized international standard and you need to implement it. Um, you'll need to have systems, protocols and tools and those systems and tools, like I mentioned, should be suitable for the type, variety, complexity and size of the operation that they support. They need to be dependable and trustworthy, have enough capacity to accurately process the data needed for activities and services in a timely manner, handle the volume of orders, messages or transactions, especially when new technology is introduced. Um, they need so to be... Do you, mind, do you mind if I jump in, Rose? Yeah. Rose, I'll just test you on that one. So if I'm a medium sized bank in the UK, you know, Cyber Essentials Plus, not good enough. ISO 27001 or NIST clearly would, would be the ones to pass muster there. That'd be the kind of conversation, wouldn't it? Yeah, and I like those equally, but I'm going to lean more towards NIST. And the reason I'm leaning more towards NIST is because it is specifically referenced in DORA in a footnote. So I think if you wanted to do belts and braces, obviously you could argue, look, we've done ISO. But this is ultimately this is not just about protecting uh, businesses from attack. It's about in the event that something happens, that is, it's almost as if they have built their legal argument and their argument for all of their stakeholders. And if you can go to your stakeholders and say, look, we did everything that was in that Digital Operational Resilience Act to the point that we implemented everything within the NIST guidance then if something does happen, you're talking about a reduced fine. You know, ICO, for example, if you have a data breach, because that's another thing, right? You breach DORA and you've got your criminal sanctions. That's one pain, but it's not, a, that pain doesn't sit alone. There's also the pain of GDPR, because if you're, if, if you're, um, if you fall within the scope of DORA, you're gonna fall within the scope of GDPR. And this brings me back to that Finnish guy that I, I mentioned, that CEO, um, who, you know, had that uh, three-month prison sentence. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's you know all of these all of these things are tying in. But ISO would be good, but I I would belt some braces it and do and, NIST. And That's apologies, we, we got two out of six there. So yeah, thanks for that. So sorry, number three. Um. Well, so so then so then the are the 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 rest of the act starts to actually look like NIST Cybersecurity Framework 1.1. 1. 1. Um, you got to identify your functions and assets, protect and prevent, detect, respond and recover. You're going to need to have backup policies and recovery methods. You need to have continuous learning and evolving, not just by the way for your management who who need to understand that's like in the first pillar but also you're going to need to train your staff and then communication you have to have responsible disclosure in the event that that something happens so th that gives you a um a kind of a flavor of of the the, the requirements without you know without go going too deep into going something. too deep and, yeah. I, and i guess for me the, the big takeaway is Nowhere in that is let's buy a new flashy box with a flashy firewall or deploy AI or all of the other things that everybody talks about in the tech world. This is all, forgive me, this is all procedural, basic, common sense stuff, but adhering to, to good standards like that. So, I mean, harking back to GDPR, we saw GDPR probably five or six years ago. And then, you know, states like California almost copied the regulations pretty quickly. I'm sure the governor of California will hate me for saying that, but he doesn't call me anymore. So who cares? <laughs> um, 
you see the either the act being copied by other countries as has happened with gdpr or do you see there's going to be a dora for the oil and gas industry in 2026 you know can by just saying i'm not a finance institute does this mean i'm going to avoid this kind of thing or two or three years time will be will we be seeing another acronym that looks and feels a lot like dora so I you know I think it will be a, adopted as a model for other critical sectors for sure. I think this is they're dipping their toe in and they're starting with the most critical sector, the financial sector. So we saw like if we just go back to the financial crisis in 2009, which essentially was because of poor risk management, right? Um, we saw the the knock on effect. We saw you know people losing pensions and homes and you know. Um, third level education funds evaporated and there was all of that kind of stuff so given its comprehensive and forward thinking approach to cybersecurity, it's absolutely yeah it did that this is going to act as a model for other critical sectors facing um, similar cyber threats um i i see i see the legal sector following it just because so here here is one of the ways i see the 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 quick um application and the accelerated adoption of a very useful provision that you know the the provision on managing the exit strategies right that we talked about so you've got a bit of kit it's not great you're continuing to pay so the people who are going to be dealing with that are going to be the lawyers and the lawyers are going to look at this and they're going to say as they start to revise all of these contracts and make sure that there's no business disruption for the banks um, and, and, and they work through all of that, they're going to say, well, hang on, if you can uh, remove yourself from a big bank with zero business disruption, then you can do it for our clients. Right. And so then you're going to start to see that provision appearing. I would imagine it's already appearing today that the lawyers for the buyer are going to say, we want to make sure that in three years time, if this kit is no longer fit for purpose, that we can just pull it out and replace it with no business disruption. And so then that is going to that that's going to to, to um, accelerate just good behaviors, I think, on the back on, on the part so, of vendors. Yeah, I, I got you. So to play that back, if I'm the CEO of a big oil company and I've got this not fit for purpose kit going on, I can go, well, supplier X, you've just provisioned to all of these banks down the street and Dora tells me you must have this provision in your contract. So I know you've done it. So it's not that hard to put it into into my contract. So I'm liking that. Brilliant. Um, I guess back to the the almost thrown in second part of my uh, my question. How come almost nobody's heard of this or is it just I'm talking to the wrong people? No, it's funny because I think it's interesting. I th and I do think it's partly I think it is partly because of Brexit. Um, and, and we saw that with, I, I think there is a sort of a fundamental misunderstanding still on our island that, you know, we're somehow disconnected from Europe. But the reality is, is that our um, our commercial relations are intertwined and that if we, you know, if you want to set up an office in Dublin, right, you're going to need to comply with all of these things. If you want to, um, yeah, if you want to, I mean, that's the most and a lot of these businesses have done it right a lot of a, a lot of british businesses now have a, an an office in europe so that they can enjoy you know the, that close connection with the biggest market on our doorstep yeah brilliant so it's so i guess it's the um it's the brexit fingers in the ears which is which is causing it so it doesn't make the reality go away i guess um going back to your article as well so i'm going to quote you here so sorry about this but you oh, are there any business that is reluctant to move to the cloud will be forced by this provision to do so, I think is square bracket. So I guess as a UK based cloud provider, we're, we're loving that. But could you elaborate that a wee bit more? I can't remember. Can you tell me the bit before? That's quite, oh, that that's quite a bold it's claim. But... It's a bit in quotes. It's it's the bit before you say go bigger and that this, this will help people who've been um, who've got investment or seeking investment to be more investable. But I think basically a hypothesis here is I think it goes back to that point about the exit strategy that I think that's really the point, the point you get into that so many people are struggling to get to cloud because they want to go to cloud. They just can't get rid of the current legacy provider and legacy kit. So I think that was probably where you're coming from. Yeah, what what you said, absolutely. At the, at the risk of putting words in, in your mouth. 
Um, I think we've talked about is more legislation available. I mean, one of the things, and you've touched on this, I think, I think quite easily. But I was going to ask you, uh, what does this mean for management? And I think so far we've determined that if you're the CEO of an organisation and you're not taking cyber seriously, this time you can actually go to jail. Reference to the Finnish guy, but is there anything more to that? And I think you know CEOs rely on lower management chains to actually go and get stuff done. So, what's your message to middle managers and leaders as well as CEOs? So I think it's going to really help them. So I, I hear this a lot um, that CISOs um, that that CISOs struggle. We have new there's there's what is there? There's thousands of CVEs, common vulnerabilities and exposures. These give rise to millions of unique malicious objects. Our sector is incredibly noisy, um, and we're hearing about all of these new things all of the time. Um, or you know there, there's 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 some mention of them and so what it's been very difficult for active CISOs to do they have said is to prioritize and Dora helps CISOs to prioritize in a way which is defensible so and this goes back to like you know if we're to say like if I was to talk about Dora in a tweet it's you need to address reasonably identifiable circumstances that can lead to bad outcomes, right? So what you need to be doing is you need to address the known significant threats. So then it's like, well, what do you mean by known? Well, if you've got the National Cybersecurity Center jumping up and down, warning you about a problem, it's reasonable that you should know about it. If on the other side of the Atlantic, you have the FBI and the IC3 writing up reports saying these are the same problems and they're matching what the NCSE is saying, that's not reasonably identifiable, that's easily identifiable. So you need to jump on the most significant threats first and then work your way down. And so then it's about, and then it starts to be about, okay, so these are the known, is it foreseeable and is it avoidable? So things that are avoidable for businesses with deep pockets might not be avoidable for businesses with small pockets. But at least then they can make the determination on like, is this a solution that they can deploy? Will it materially help their firm? Do they really need it? Um, and then they can move forward like that. So, so for me, Dora is really useful. And this is and I and I said that in this article as well about um, you know making better decisions faster. There is a huge amount of savings that businesses can make if they understand how they can very quickly come to these conclusions. So, for example, I would submit that if the National Cybersecurity Center is banging the drum saying this is the most significant threat, which they did recently, by the way, for the legal sector. So they published a report for the legal sector and they said, guys, this is your biggest problem. This is your solution. Right. So there should be no conversation internally in a law firm, in my view, as to whether or not we should fix it. You just fix that. You've been told by a trusted independent expert that this is the biggest problem and that this is going to lead to all of these other attendant issues, including and not limited to, um, you know, uh, significant um, data issues regarding commercially sensitive and, and, and personally sensitive information. Um, so, yeah, so the, 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 in, in that way, you're able to then just get to the heart of the matter really quickly in a, in a, in a brutal way, which is cost efficient for your firm. Well, do you know, you, you've just touched on something which was in your article, because, again, I think you said something like if the NCSC or the FBI are telling you this is a credible threat and you haven't acted, then you've not acted reasonably. And, and the thing I like about this is the word reasonable is all over the place. And we all know reasonable will be tested in the court of law. I mean, in my notes on your article, I scribbled in there. This kind of means everybody's got to have a SOC, a security operations center. So what struck me there is NCSC could be shouting from the rooftops about a particular threat. But if you don't have the ability to hear that or consume that, most boards that I speak to struggle to know that NCSC is, is actually a thing, apart from maybe, maybe the CIO. So I think most decent sized financial institutions do have a SOC, do have an analyst capability. And then I find a whole load of others who, who don't. So I think in that case, you know, the people are shouting, but the some of the customers, some of the victims, if I can call them that, don't have listeners or don't have the right people to listen. So 
Do you think that's a fair translation? I do. I do. But I have so much sympathy for boards because they don't have one significant problem to deal with. They have about a thousand and it's trying to elevate the cyber risk over and above that noise um, so that it gets the, the time and attention that it really deserves. So, you know, yesterday I was chatting to someone where I was like setting the scene and I was like, look, you know, we've had two banks go wallet within the last, you know, since, uh, you know, in 2023, we had Silicon Valley Bank and we had Credit Suisse, um, you know, go. So you have that. Then you have got like, you know, you've got inflation. Then you've got all of the Brexit issues as well. And, you know, supply chain and stuff. We've got a war going on in Europe and there's going to be businesses that have to deal with all of that. You've got a cyber skills shortage, you know, so there's, you know, the figure is between 3.2 and 3.5 million. But then at the same time, you know, people are talking about this expanding cyber threat landscape and you're like, well, gosh, well, if it's 3.5 million, but the threat landscape continues to expand, is that number an underestimation? Then you've got hiring issues. You hire the wrong person. It usually takes about six months. You know, boards have a lot, a lot, a lot to deal with. Um, and I think that's what what's happened before is that, you know, to, to a, a large degree, it was being dealt with adequately by many uh, CIOs, um, but that it's just that we need to have, we now need to push out that knowledge right throughout the board so that when even the CIO comes, that they're much, that, that they're much more able to digest the information and then execute on it. So I, I, I think there's a bit of a knowledge gap in the board. But yeah, I think, look, and I'm not blaming anybody. I think that this is the natural evolution of anything that's kind of like 20 years old, right? You no, know? And, and, and I agree with you. Uh, uh, the sympathy with the board point, board should mm. be running organizations, not bothering about cyber. Experts should be bothering about cyber. I guess from a personal view, I'll hate myself for being quoted on this, but the only good thing I've seen about ransomware is boards actually want to talk about these issues now, whereas before it was it was swept under the carpet. So um, that's brilliant. I'm conscious we've been talking for a while and those who know you and me <laughs> were worried that we talked for five hours just just on hello. So I was going to open it up to questions. I know we, we should come back to some closing comments and just close out with a few tidbits of advice. But I want to see if there's any questions out there, Ahmed, from the floor or in chat. I'm not seeing any coming through just yet, but we can have a quick look. Yeah, please do raise your hand if you have a question um, and I'll unmute you. And of course, if Tumbleweed blows, I will keep on asking Roach questions. So while a bit of Tumbleweed, oh, there we go, attendee number 23. The microphone is virtually running to you as Ahmed presses an unmute button, I think, is the way it works. Yes, I've just requested, there we go. Hi, uh, there you go. Hi, it's Martin Simpson. This is a fascinating conversation. Thank, thanks very much. I just wanted to get your thoughts on what can um, particularly regulated entities in the UK, what can they reuse from the FCA's um, uh, uh, regulation around operational resilience? So this isn't starting from scratch for them, right? There's there's stuff that can be reused and, and leveraged. Is that is that a true statement? Just love your thoughts. So the last F, uh, FCA document I picked up, so when I talk about DORA, I say bigger, better, faster, stronger. It is sensible, it's risk management, plain vanilla risk management. The last FCA document, and it may not be the same one that you're talking about, but I called it too woolly, too narrow, too little, too late. Um, and I felt that DORA was a much stronger proposition and I also think it's the way things are going to go. So if you look, if you're a regulated um, entity here, it, it, what is helpful is the new proposed SEC rules um, across in, uh, in, in New York. Um, that would be helpful. But look, if you comply with DORA, um, my, my view is, is that because that is linked to the international standards, you're likely to comply with everything else. Um, but 
it might know we'll be really interested to to have a chat with you afterwards to see if that's the same document we're talking about because if it is the same document that i call too woolly too narrow too little too late on operational resilience i think cyber is only used six times in that document and it's just not strong enough on it may be strong on the operational resilience side but not on the digital operational resilience side which is really what we need to see but Without seeing the document you're referring to, um, I don't know. We can hook you both up, as it were, after yeah. the call. And I guess the flip side of, of the question there, if I can build on that, I was going to say, so if you've got NIST or if you've got ISO, it doesn't mean you're DORA compliant at all, but it's a, it's a pretty good run at it. That would be, would that be fair? Yeah, 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 100%. I mean, there's, look, look, there are new obligations in it, like, uh, with respect to information sharing for example and there's a time frame for disclosure the time frame to just for disclosure is this three phases one as soon as you know about a problem you're really under an obligation to to um to reveal that to the um to the competent authority this is how it works if you have um if, if, if you've got more than two hours left in the day, it has to be on the day. If you, I think if it's, you've got two hours, um, less than two hours. So if your core business hours are like nine to five and it's five past three and you learn that you have a problem, you then kick it to the next day and then you've got four hours in the next day to report it. But the clock starts ticking from the moment that you report that, then you have a week for the second phase and then you have a month, um, so four weeks, to deliver your final report. So that's quite a uh, exacting and demanding time frame for um, for businesses to operate on. But if you can do that, then I don't see how it's going to be any more painful if something else comes down the line. You know, I I, I think that that's that that's quite demanding. I I. I yeah, so if you can conform to that, you can pretty much uh, conform to anything. And I love the word problem. So problem could mean one of my data centers is on fire. I feel I need to tell the competent authority. Nothing's actually down. There's no ransomware threat, but I've got a big problem and it could affect my resilience. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I think so. But I would I'd need that in front of me to answer such a, you know, yeah. such a, a detailed uh, question. You need to whiteboard that one. And then I guess. Um, we're quite into gathering as much intelligence on criminal attacks before they happen. So, you know, the several days minus the zero day. So imagine we've uh, looked on the dark web and we know we're pretty confident somebody's going to launch a ransomware on a customer in 30 days. Mm. That, again, seems like a, I mean, it seems why wouldn't you tell the competent authority? I think what I've taken from your statement is go early is better than go late in this kind of notification game. Yeah, I think that in the absence of any clear guidance or rules businesses preferred not to reveal or disclose and i look you can understand that if you're not under an obligation to disclose stuff and disclosing it could create pains for your business well then you just don't do it right that's that's just it's it's very unless, simple it's very simple it's very binary pain down the line i guess would be the only logic with that one you know yeah yeah absolutely it's it's it's, it's that's binary for for lawyers we're under no obligation to do it doing it could cause us problems let's not do it that's how, how that would go okay interesting one we sh one we should plow into more um just checking if there's any more questions before we we call it a wrap But thanks, Martin, for your question. We'll we'll yeah, follow through good. there. Um, so look, just give us the top three things, Rosh. I mean, I, I've taken and, and clearly this is this is my, my way of closing things in. But yeah. you said this can accelerate the move to cloud. I think I'm seeing a lot more about threat intelligence, which is music to my ears. So that that's all good from a pure cyber point of view. But yeah, if you're in front of the CEO of a mid-sized UK bank and they're staring at at you when we've mentioned Dora, what are the big three things you're going to say just to get him or her just to take this seriously? Oh gosh, that's. I thought you were going to ask me a different question, so I was scribbling some notes. I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to say, there's a lot of noise in our sector, so you need to consider your source, right? So all of the time, keep looking to see how it links to some international standard or best practice. That's that will be number one. In fact, maybe that's something that you should take to the board, right? This is a non-significant threat. These independent, trusted actors 
have told us this, we are obliged to address reasonably identifiable circumstances. That is not reasonably identifiable, it's easily identifiable. We have no room to maneuver. We need to get this sorted. And just to prove that you're not destined for a career in politics, you know, a politician would have answered the question you wanted me to ask. So feel free to answer the question you wanted me to ask. Then we can guess what the question was. But go on, what were, what were you expecting me to ask? And then we can answer that one as well. <laughs> so I was expecting you to say, like, well, you know, well, what are the three things that, that businesses can do today? And I yeah, would have yeah. said, I would have said pretty much the same thing. I would have said, consider the, your source, but solve the biggest problems first. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Solve your biggest problems first and make sure that the kit that you're putting in place or that you have in place is fit for purpose, not just for today, but for tomorrow. Right. So there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that was devised really nifty 10 years ago, 15, nearly 20 years ago um, that, you know, that didn't anticipate the move to cloud and that move to cloud products is creating problems um you know for the 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 solutions that are currently in place it, all of that i mean it really does need to sort of be like forensically examined okay so we have all of this in place are there any problems that have arisen that you know that we need to solve for so that we are now complying with, you know, that it's reliable, it's trustworthy, it's technologically resilient, it has sufficient capacity to withstand, you know, the volumes of traffic, all of that kind of stuff needs to be dealt with. And, you know, that's an interesting point. So challenge I have on a, on a daily basis, uh, just as we're closing out is somebody will always say to me, this thing is the latest thing in cyber and it's the best thing today. And I go, well, yeah, but does it integrate with the things we've got? And will it be the best thing tomorrow? And, and I'm I'm actually happier to go with a fewer number of vendors that work and play together well, as opposed to the so-called best thing, best in class thing this month. And then if it's not best in class in five years time, I've got to just do that exit thing, which is back to whole mm -hmm. exit provision. So there's a lot to be said for going with the vendors, you know, you're with for the long term, as opposed to the, the greatest thing this week. So no, that's brilliant. Well, look, Rach, um, that just gives me a few minutes to say on behalf of everybody, thanks again for taking time out of your, your busy work life, your busy travel life. As I said, for those who missed it when we joined, flipping between the House of Lords Advisory Committee, NATO, the EU, and working for a rapidly growing brand new partner of Node 4, namely Redshift. So no, thanks again. And um, yeah, tune in next month, everyone. I think we've got Joe from uh, Salt Communications, a Belfast uh, cyber entrepreneurial group who's... Um, big into cyber encryption uh, on mobiles and mobile estate. Thanks everyone. And um, see you all next month. Thanks again, Roche.